Welcome to the National Library of Australia. I'm Libby Cass, Director of Curatorial and Collection Research here at the National Library. I'd like to begin by acknowledging Australia's First Nations peoples as the traditional owners and custodians of this land and give my respect to Elders, past and present, and through them to all Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. This afternoon's presentation is by Dr Andrew Levitas, one of the 2021 National Library of Australia Fellows. Andrew's fellowship is one of two fellowships in Japan studies awarded this year, which are both funded through the HS Williams Trust Fund. Andrew is presently a research associate fellow in the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Cambridge and a member of the project, Charting the Geography of Power, Visualising the Shifting Landscape from Imperial to Post-War East Asia through War Crimes Trials. Andrew's fellowship project, The Dream Worlds of Empire, focuses on Manchukuo's destruction at the hands of the Soviet Union in August 1945, which haunted the right-wing and socialist imagination and had a profound impact on their hostility towards the USSR and international communism. He explores the transnational network of bureaucrats, bureaucrats, soldiers and propagandists who serve the Japanese and Manchukuo empires and their role in shaping right-wing and socialist politics in Cold War East Asia. Andrew has drawn on the library's unique collection that documents Japanese political history in the 20th century, including a collection of documents, notebooks and pamphlets of the Japan Japanese Socialist Party. Please welcome Dr. Andrew Levitas to discuss his project further. Thanks so much, Libby, for that very kind introduction. Um, you know, I hope, I hope the work comes out well for it. Um, I want to thank, first of all, the Harold S. Williams Trust for providing um, the means for the fellowship, and long may it remain, because it is an essential pillar for the study of modern Japanese history in Australasia and in the world, and its importance will only grow in time. I'd like to express my thanks to the fellowship section here at the library, to Sharon Simone, without whom I might never have found my way back from the UK to Australia. Uh, their warmth and their good humour has made all the difference. One of the things I realised when I came back to Australia was the introduction um, to thank the traditional owners of the land. Um, so if you'll excuse me as a returned Australian, I might give my own little version of that. I think for me to respect the owners of the land, past and present, we have to enshrine the Uluru Statement of the Heart into law. Uh, and for me, that I think is important. So. During my stay here at the National Library, I've begun preliminary work on a second book project, which explores the transwar discourse and imaginary of the Japanese right, from the world of empire to the Cold War, and their role in shaping anti-communist internationalism in 20th century East Asia. At the heart of this transwar project are the artifacts of empire, of, of the wartime empire and Cold War internationalism. Comp pamphlets, speeches, journals, conference proceedings, personal papers and diaries of renowned and forgotten ideologues of the right in post-imperial Asia. The reconstruction of anti-communist internationalism in East Asia requires a multi-archival and multilingual approach involving Japanese sources in Japanese, Korean, and Chinese. And it's here that I want to say a few words about the National Library's, the collection of the National Library. The National Library of Australia houses, as I found through my stay here, a sizable repository of archival material on Cold War Asia, which has not necessarily made its way into contemporary major works on this era. I've spent the last three months working through the library's archives, and in the process, coming across pamphlets, informal publications, documents, magazines associated with the two major transnational anti-communist networks, the Asian People's Anti-Communist League and the Asian Parliamentarians Union. Although the volumes overlap in some regards to holdings in Japan, Taiwan, and the United States, the breadth of the material available here at the National Library, many of which were delivered by the organizations themselves, provides a tantalizing details of the ideologues and the ideologies and the inner workings of internationalism of the right in Cold War Asia. 
So the NLA collection lists well in excess of 60 major documents relating to both the Asian People's Anti-Communist League and the Asian Parliamentarians Union in a mix of Japanese, Chinese, English and other sources, with the bulk of the sources focusing on the periods between 1955 and the mid-1980s. The NLA possesses a near complete collection of the Asian People and People's Anti-Communist League's pamphlets and their ideological tracts which provide, I think, a real, a real insight into the group's mechanics and, the di and how they disseminated their anti-communist worldview across Asia. The titles of the books range from the studies of people's communes to Wither Indonesia, PKI, and the CCP. The library has a near complete holdings of the newsletter Frontlines, published in French and English out of a makeshift Saigon office of the, of the then Republic of Vietnam, of South Vietnam. The library's collection also, and I think uniquely for not just East Asian specialists or uh, historians of the Cold War, but for uh, historians of Australia, the NLA's collection provides a unique glimpse into a certain into a time and place. Of, from the 1950s through to the 1970s, when Australian politicians and po political and religious conservatives, people like Houston, Houston R. Tracy, Kevin Cairns, or Senator George Hanan, turned to Asia as they sought to continue their ideological fight against both the Labour Party, the unions, and the left in Australia. Now let me shift gears a little bit. Um, the project, as I've mentioned, I've been working on here, broadly conceived, is a continuation of my work at the intersection of empire, global intellectual history, and modern Japanese and East Asian history. And, but it's also a new departure. The project repositions the formation of Japanese and East Asian anti-communist internationalism as an integral episode in the global Cold War, challenging dominant historical narratives which focus mostly on the United States and Western Europe. Although Asian anti-communism, communist re regionalism peaked in around the late 1970s, you could argue, the institutions themselves never disappeared. Rather, they were rebranded. They rebranded themselves under new names and with new missions as auxiliaries in the conservative right in the 1980s, forming what might be seen as a powerful thread of continuity in, into the late, 20, late 20th and even up to the present, 20th century and up to the present. As a trans-war political tradition, anti-communism has its own history. One of striking continuities, but also contradictions, reformation, re reformulations and repurposings. It was never an unchanging principle of principle. Rather, it was a malleable web of ideas and politics which changed in response to the concrete political circumstances and across different eras. In Japan in the 1920s, anti-communism was tied to military fears of the stability of the empire rather than ideological hostility to the Soviet Union. By the mid-1930s, anti-communism was part of the was part of the anti common term pact with Germany and with National Socialist Germany and Mussolini's Italy. And later, the New Order reformers strived to overthrow the existing domestic and international status quo. In the transition to the Cold War, anti communism provided what one historian has called an enabling idea, which underpinned a conservative effort to, reckon, to both reconcile with the United States but also to fight a rearguard action against ref the reforms of the, occupa of the occupation at, at home in Japan. In the transition from the world of empire to the Cold War, anti-communism was reinvented and invested with a new ideological repertoire. In publications such as The Nation and Politics, Minzoku to Seiji, intellectuals, propagandists, and writers brokers made explicit the connections between the Red Purges in Japan and the militarized projects to counter the spread of communism overseas in Korea and Taiwan and Southeast Asia. In articles and roundtables, politicians and thinkers fashioned new forms of post-imperial Asian solidarity as they navigated, survived, upheld, and contested empire. The same men and women who during the 1930s and 40s had sustained Japan's wartime new order, in the post-war now became anti-communist, recasting their pre-war commitments into a new, into a putative third way of international politics. It was Japan's mission, they argued, to mediate and reconcile Asian anti-colonialism with the, with the anti-communist West. In their retelling and re misremembering, Japan emerges as the true anti-colonial power 
one whose fight against Western imperialism and was now a fight for national liberation against the red imperialism of Moscow and Beijing. In what follows, I argue against the severing of empire and the Cold War. Well, Oh yeah, so um, for in the Cold War and collapsing of the boundaries between imperial, transnational, and area studies. To do so, I'll examine the Japanese, how the Japanese right drew on Manchuk on Manchukuo Empire, the fallen state of Manchukuo, and its, and its ideology, while adjusting them to the dynamics of the Cold War in East Asia. In, the post in post-1945 Japan, the memory of Manchukuo, the fallen empire in Northeast China, was expressed through a distinctive mode of political aspiration, personal desire, and nostalgia. Morishige Hisaya's 1959 Manchurian Ballad, released 14 years after the destruction of Manchukuo and performed in a haunting mix of Japanese, Mongolian, Mongolian, Russian, evoked a howling winds, daily struggles and ordeals of the unforgiving, cold and bleak Manchurian winter. In post-imperial memoirs, and that is surely what they are, what the memoirs of imperial service and the agonies of decline are, Japanese officials convey the materiality and the transactions of the severed colonial ties. The industrial behemoths of Anshan, the agricultural plentitude, dreams of an economy of self-sufficiency. For these men, Manchukuo was a lost object of identification, entwined in a kind of imperial imaginary of Japanese modern power and war pan pancreatics, a riven domain of railways, inter-imperial competition, and imperial anxieties. What is missing in this imperial nostalgia, of course, was any recognition of the violent colonialism-initiated industrialization, militarized workplaces, concentrated resettlements and populations in turn dispossessed, experimented on. It's never mentioned. How Manchukuo captured the transwar Japanese right wing's imagination owes much to the circumstances of the 1930s and 1940s. For on a remote, on a remote periphery of the Japanese empire in September 1931, radical military officers of the Kwantung army, horrified by the disruption of global depression, intensified military threat from the Soviet Union, and committed ideologically at home to a Showa restoration, launched a series of military campaigns to overthrow the Northeastern Chinese warlord Jiang Xueliang. In the hands of prominent Japanese Imperial Army commanders Ishiwara Kanji, Itagaki Seishiro, and Sasaki Toichi, the Manchurian incident was transformed into a highly militarized 14-year state-building enterprise, wedding together military necessity with anti-capitalism, agrarianism, and empire. The ideological repercussions of this drove the politics of the metropole in the early 1930s, collapsing the political cabinets in Tokyo and reconstituting the discourse, priorities, and orientation of the Japanese, of Japanese empire. Manchukuo, the destruction of this state of Manchukuo at the hands of the great powers in August 1945, following the Soviet invasion, haunted the right-wing imagination, and it exerted a profound impact on their ideological hostilities towards the USSR and international communism. As accounts of the brutal violence of Manchukuo's imperial collapse filtered back, from the wholesale rebellion of the army to the capture of the Manchukuo Emperor, the future premier Kishi Nobusuke, then imprisoned in Sagamo, among the traitors, warlords, leaders of the puppet regimes and exiled armies from the edges of the empire, followed the course of the Chinese Civil War intently. Shenyang's falling, Manchuria is completely in the hands of the communist Chinese, as is most of the northern part of Shandong. Communist forces are heading towards the banks of the Yangtze, he wrote. In his prison diaries for November 1948, Kishi evoked again the violent ends of Manchukuo as he set out his proposal for the raising of a multinational volunteer division of Japanese military veterans and right-wing youth to fight in the cause of anti-communism in Asia. The invocation of the fallen Manchukuo empire was no aberration, nor were they the solitary ruminations of a former high official of the deposed Emperor Puyi. During the 1950s and the 1960s, officials of the fallen Manchurian Empire, the frontline soldiers of Japan's Greater East Asia War, sought to halt what they saw as the post-war decadence of Japan and the march of communism in East Asia. These former soldiers, bureaucrats, propagandists, and ideologues sought to reframe themselves as soldiers in a larger global and regional ideological war. <laughs> 
The Japanese of the right were no strangers to internationalism, as many historians have shown. Rather, empire served as a touchstone for their political imaginary, and it played a very large role in structuring their fierce anti-communism. Through their peregrinations to the front lines of the wartime empire in, in Manchuria and China, Japanese rightist lives and their careers were enmeshed in the, in the construction of the wartime new order, at the height of what David Modadell has called the global authoritarian moment in the 1930s, with the cannonade of the Manchurian incident and renditions of the song Asia, Asia, our Asia, ringing in their ears, Japanese, many of whom imperial bureaucrats, many of whom went on to political leadership in the post-war, styled themselves as the vanguard of a world revolutionized by strong leadership, militarism, physical discipline, and collectivism. As we shall see, pan-Asianism, which united nationalism and internationalism with notions of cultural unity, racial kinship, and, and geographic proximity, were key to their trans-war worldviews. As we unpick as we unpick the tangled skeins of these Cold War anti-communist networks, we are led in unexpected directions. Some threads connect back to the remarkable presence of many former officials of the Manchukuo Empire in post-1945 Japan Asian internationalism. Other strands, co strands connect to the careers of former Korean and Taiwan and Chinese soldiers of the Imperial Japanese Army, and still more to the collaborationist regimes and the armies from Indonesia, the Philippines, and Vietnam where anti-colonial nationalists flocked to Manchukuo to seek their fortunes. At the height of the Sino-Japanese war, war, an elite group of students from across Asia were selected to study in Manchuria, to train what they imagined to be the post-war elite of a Japanese-dominated regional order. At the end of the war, these students streamed back to their home countries, and they made their lives, from Niigata in Japan to Dalian, and from Tokyo to Ulaanbaatar and different places. What had they seen in the Chinese Northeast? What survived of the dreams which drove them to Manchukuo at the height of the Japanese Empire? And how can we understand the enduring intellectual and personal connections that cross the disappearance of Manchukuo, the collapse of the Japanese Empire, the Cold War, and up to the present. What I want to suggest is we need to widen our angle of approach when considering the imperial afterlives of the Japanese Empire, and of Manchukuo in particular, as inspiration, a moral lesson, or for some an alternative to, to the global ideological tensions of the Cold War, of Cold War binaries. To a remarkable degree, the memory of the Manchukuo Empire forms, I think, a subterranean or a key, if contested one, of the Japanese right-wing Cold War imaginary, one which the Japanese turned to seek alternatives to the binaries of the Cold War, and one which they transformed into a touchstone for defining Japan's informal connections with Asia, with Asia's anti-colonial nationalist leaders from the 1950s well into the 1970s. So despite Japan's remarkable transition into a key ally and stronghold of American power in Asia, ex-imperial elites remained uncomfortable with their subordinate, subordinate place in the US sphere of influence. And so they recast their wartime pan-Asianism into a cultural vision of Japan as a bridge between the US and Cold War Asia. Anti-communism provided the vehicle to institutionalize and sell their ideas by marketing wartime connections with it and political expertise to help America navigate a rapidly decolonizing world. The Chinese Civil War served as the initial proving ground for Japan's new anti-communist international and the geopolitical background to the forging of the security alliance with the United States. In this area, veteran politics became a kind of uh, a place of, you know, of mobilization, of anti-communist mobilization. Ex-commanders of Japan's China Expeditionary Army under General Okamura Yasuji trained, helped train KMT armies, nationalist Chinese armies on Taiwan in their fight against the Chinese communists. While in the Republic of Korea, Major General Park Chung-hee launched a military revolution with a cohort of Korean soldiers trained in the Manchuria Military Academy in May 1961. Within Japan, military veterans continued their fight against communism and other internal enemies, working for the occupation's G2 intelligence at the height of the American-initiated 
red purges and leftist left red purge of leftist and progressive forces from public life. Between the 1950s and the 1970s, ex prime ministers, ex prime ministers, suspected war criminals, returnees from the Manchukuo Empire, and shadowy fixers, and ex imperial military commanders played a central role in shaping right wing politics. Not only in not only in East Asia, they were in. East, in East Asia, recasting Imperial Japan's visions of state power, military-led development, and anti-Western internationalism into an alternative Cold War internationalism. The diplomatic campaign to transform Japan into a stronghold of anti-communism was enmeshed in a world of political conferences, mass movements, anti-communist violence, and American conservative media circuits. At the center of this a transnational anti-communist movement was a diverse but highly organized transnational anti-communist network. The Asian People's Anti-Communist League, the APACL, founded jointly by the Republic of Korea and Taiwan, the Asian Parliamentarians Union, and the International Spiritualist Movement, the International Federation for Victory Over Communism. What we see when we look at this tangled history is a defeat in war did not preclude international influence for the Japanese. Through their transnational networks, Japanese ex-imperial leaders developed close personal and professional relationships with former enemies and leaders of ex-colonies. People such as Chiang Kai-shek, uh, who had fled to Taiwan in 1949 following defeat in the Chinese Civil War at the hands of Mao Zedong, where he would govern until his death in 1975. And Pak Chung-hee, the head of the ruling military junta, who seized political power and established a, a political regime in Korea zealously dedicated to modernization. For nearly three decades, these anti-communist networks structured Japan's, or helped structure Japan's, post-war return to Asia. And they formed the core of what, we can, of what can be seen as a counter-mobilization to the international solidarity and anti-imperialism put forth at the Asian, Afro-Asian Conference in Bandung, Indonesia, in 1965. In the hands of these elite, in the hands of these of these Japanese elites and authoritarian post-colonial uh, post-colonial leaders in Southeast Asia, internationalism and transnational networking were harnessed not for national liberation or third world state making, but for a counter-revolutionary purpose. One of the most important places I think to look for glimpses or you know gleamings of Manchukuo's afterlife in the Cold War is in response to the Japanese writers, writers to the meaning of the first Afro-Asian conference in Bandung. Bandung became a proxy in their, in their, in their debates for, the, for these fierce divisions among conservatives within Japan and elsewhere over the memory of Manchukuo. As, Manchukuo. As part of their efforts to forge an international the right, ex-imperial leaders recast Manchukuo's vision of you know, state power and military-led development into an alternative regionalism. And this became a vision for them, a way to seek a third way through the binaries, not simply of capitalism and communism, but to, to articulate a place for Japan within that was both compatible with its position within a U.S.-led order, but also spoke to, the old, to a kind of older discourse of Pan-Asianism, which positioned Japan in the kind of leadership role of the region. So it was Manchukuo, for, for some of the Japanese elite, played this interesting role. Um, so we can see this role, we can see this um, playing out at the eighth, at the eighth general assembly of the APAC, AP, you know, the Asian People's Anti-Communist League, hosted in Tokyo in May 1962, where ex-premier Kishinobusuke spoke before a gathering of former Manchurian elites, the bureaucrats, soldiers, and imperial propagandists. He spoke on at a kind of off the conference meeting in a, at, a, at um, one of the hotels in Tokyo. Um, so after his short remarks on the smooth operation of the conference, Kishi redirected his, com his speech back to Manchukuo, giving an expansive historical take on the fate of the 14-year empire, which for over a decade had stood the front lines of, of what he saw as an international war against communism. Even more interesting in my mind is the attempt to use the legacy and memory of Manchuria to recast Japan in an era of decolonization as the true anti-colonial power one which fought against the imperialism of the Western powers, 
in the 1930s, as well as was still fighting against the danger of communist imperialism, which now thre threatened the, the new independence of Southeast Asia. As we delve into the afterlives of these severed ties between Japan and East Asia and Southeast Asia, we see the embers of a kind of pre-war political tradition, of the tradition, one which stoked the politics of anti-communism in Asia well into the 1970s. Connections between Japanese ex-imperial leaders and the rulers of Taiwan, Korea, the Philippines, Indonesia were underpinned, not just by shared experiences, but by historical memories of total war, mass mobilization, industrialized warfare, which structured their worldview and, their de and also their distinctive approach to governance well into the, well the post-war decades. This goes back to something. It goes back to what the the kind of what you what can be seen as a radical process of imperial ideological assimilation and military mobilization practiced by Japan within the, imper the wartime imperium in the 1930s, which which I would argue was central to the worldview of a generation of Asian elites who took on leadership roles during the era of decolonization. These experiences provided Asian elites with a shared vocabulary, one which was forged in the, from the drill fields of army barracks in Japan and Manchukuo, Manchukuo which, linked the milit which linked leaders from across Asia together. Together, these connections, I think, in their, both their political, their ideological, and in the decades that they covered, they complicate our understanding in many, in many ways, especially of the relationship between nationalist claims imperial nostalgia, and internationalist commitment. We see these forces, I think, playing out again in the extraordinary conference of the Asian People's Anti-Communist League held in Seoul between May 10th and 16th, 1962, to celebrate the one-year anniversary of the military revolution led by Park Chung-hee. The conference was a lavish affair, with massive rallies, public lectures, mass games, pub and pu uh, public plays, as well as banquets. The extraordinary meeting included members from across the region, including Australia, South Africa, Jordan, uh, far away, you know, South Africa, Jordan, and Lebanon. As the inauguration, at the inauguration of the ceremony, Park Chung-hee took the stage, and in, in his in his talk, speech, he emphasized and outlined his plans for the raising of a multinational anti-communist army to aid the, the Republic of China's military attempt to liberate the Chinese mainland. And he combined it with, a, with calls for the creation of an anti-communist freedom center, which would focus on both fighting communism, technological transfers, and the fostering of a kind of mass cultural movement at the grassroots level across of Asia, one which he imagined would end would build a harmonious relationship between labor and capital. Reflecting on the first anniversary of the military revolution, Park reaffirmed his commitment to maintaining military and spiritual strength and on strengthening Korea through a series of five-year plans. Park's speech reverberated. One Japanese participant wrote in his um, notebook with the traces of the songs of the show restoration. He prayed for Kishinobusuke, the, the ex-premier there, he wrote he in decade, decades later or two decades later in 1980s in his final book before his death he wrote that park was what was the last true soldier of the manchurian empire okay so by conclusion so Manchukuo generated, as we've seen, so Manchukuo generated imperial afterlives far beyond the sino-japanese relations and the industrial inheritance of the fallen empire the memory of Manchukuo, that's not working. The memory of Manchukuo and service in northeastern China in the 1930s created the ideological and personal connections which undergrid transnational anti-communism in East Asia from the 1950s, 60s through to the 70s. It generated mobilizations of conservatives, nationalists, and pan-Asianists you know, across the region. Uh, of Japanese and formed, I think, a key dimension of Japanese engagement with East Asia. Thank you. So, of course, Manchukuo's lasting resonance and its importance must be teased out carefully without overstating the case. Service in Manchukuo and the memory of the fallen empire were but one of many dimensions of Japanese Cold War conservative internationalism. International. Looking at Manchukuo's role in the Japanese Cold War imaginaries and how the legacies Thank you so much. There we go. And how the legacies of 
service in northeastern China was remembered, transformed, and repurposed by the conservative, by conservatives, opens up, I think, important questions, which decenter Japan's Cold War relationship with the United States and provides insights into other meaningful alignments in international communities' affiliation. It reminds us that historical memory can be marshaled not only for the service of reconciliation, but into a starkly different project of right-wing internationalism. The echoes of Manchukuo, the fallen empire, are hard to trace, and the way they unfold and intersected with the Cold War realities is complex. Yet the echoes of this, of this empire shape not just the Cold War imaginary of Japanese conservatives, and, but many authoritarian nationalists throughout Asia. So I want to conclude with the following remarks. This is an image of Australians who attended the, um, Asian, the Asian People's Anti-Communist League in the 1970s. The Cold War collections held here at the National Library are, valu are invaluable reminders of the, you know, the Cold War, uh, invaluable reminders of the importance of a specialized Asian collection to the original goals of the library. And, is an, it, is, and it serves as an unparalleled repository for, the, for Asian historical materials, printed, audio, visual. By any measure, the National Library's collection ranks at the top of Asian collections in Australia. But more than that, it is the history of Australia in Asia. Of Australians, of Australia's constitutive role in the for, in forging a post-imperial order in Asia from the 1940s to the present, it is our own prehistory. It is the it is the history of this country, and it is the history of and it, and it serves another purpose. It is the history of a, a Asian views of Australia, how this country and its history was read, imagined, and contested from the outside in. It is the it is in its entirety the material record of our prehistory, the prehistory of our place in Asia. That is why when I, see, when I see the collection now, I see the reading room where I've been sitting for um, three months, uh, I see it empty of books. I'm left with an inescapable sense of loss. At the heart of this is the, is the sense of farewell to the memory of Australia in Asia and farewell to my voice. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew, for that fascinating talk. For those watching who are also researchers in the field of Asian studies, you may be interested to know that applications for the National Library's 2022 Asia Study Grants will be open next Monday, 5 July. These grants offers researchers the opportunity to immerse themselves in the National Library's collection for four weeks. Further information about these grants is available on the National Library's website. We're not able to take questions today, but you'll find Andrew on Twitter at Andrew underscore Levitas, and I'm sure he'd be happy to field any questions. Thank you all very much for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you at our next fellowship presentation.